Hi Paul, give me the 20 second overview of your career, where you came from and where you are now. 20 seconds and counting. Adelaide, South Australia is home to me, did my uh, high school in here, went to Canberra, the Australian National University for a Bachelor of Science degree, wanted to start my astronomical career at that point in time, couldn't quite do it in Canberra, went to Victoria, British Columbia, did a graduate degree there, three years later I ended up at York University via Kitt Peak Observatory, McGraw-Hill Observatory, and I have been an astronomer at York University in Toronto, Ontario since 1986, as far as I'm concerned, the best job in the world, or out of this world, whichever way you want to think of it. When did you decide you wanted to be an astronomer? Oh, back in about grade three, uh, always wanted to be an astronomer. Cannot ever remember wanting to be a firefighter, police officer, writer, garbage collector. Always wanted to be an astronomer. Very single-minded uh, in my attitude in that regard. Grade three, that's when the report card said he liked the solar system and planets, had a terrific knowledge of it. Never looked back, never wanted to be anything else, didn't take no for an answer. What was the thing that sparked off your interest originally? Couldn't tell you. Could not tell you. As far as I'm concerned, I can never remember a moment in my life where I did not want to be studying the universe, to be an astronomer. Never, ever wanted to be anything but that. So I, I can't tell you one single moment, one aha. As far as I was concerned, I was born to be an astronomer, and that was the attitude I always took. Now, did anyone ever try to talk sense into you and say, look, you've got albinism, <laughs> you've got terrible eyesight, being an astronomer is actually not a wise career choice? A couple of my high school teachers didn't try to talk me out of it, but they did point out that there were perhaps some fundamental issues here, like you had difficulty seeing, and perhaps being an astronomer was not the best career choice, but when they saw my level of determination, when my parents stood beside me and said, if he wants to be an astronomer as far as we're concerned, we'll give him every opportunity. I had the academic credentials behind me. None of those people ever seriously tried to say, no, you can't do it, because they began to realize that, gosh, <laughs> he probably can do it. And as I said, I never took no for an answer. I, I went from strength to strength through my education, stayed with physics and chemistry and mathematics, did quite well, carried on with that at university, and it uh, became pretty evident to people that, gosh, well, if he wants to be an astronomer, get out of his way. And they did. Fantastic. Tell me, how did you achieve um, a professorship in astronomy, um, despite having such poor vision? Yeah, that, that was a little more of a challenge, I must admit. Um, when I was, I went to Canada, completed my graduate studies, married my wife, so married to quite happily 30 years later. Uh, the notion of moving into the university setting to be a full-time astronomer became a little bit daunting. You know, the idea of you know, getting a job which was a good job for the family and the right location. So those reality checks actually did begin to come into the situation after I completed my graduate studies. And I worked uh, for the Atomic Energy of Canada for three years. I looked after a nuclear reactor. Um, and, and that was fun and interesting and different, but it was using my physics background. But I realized during that stint that I really wanted to be a professional astronomer. I had always wanted to be. I was continuing to be an amateur astronomer and my day job was you know, a physicist. But I realized after three years of doing that that I wanted to stop looking down at neutrons and wanted to start looking up at photons. So went through the motions, went to Kitt Peak Observatory, was a support scientist at McGraw-Hill Observatory, and then the opportunity arose for me to apply for a position at York University. And that really was, was the beginning. I, I took the opportunity that came at me at that point in time, and while I was not a professor at that moment in time, I was basically looking after their observatory. I began to do some teaching at the university. They realized this guy really can't teach not only look after an observatory, uh, and that position became available to me to you know, change the pathway of being just looking after an observatory and, and observing to being a teacher, a lecturer, an academic administrator, and still looking after the observatory. And, you know, I, I was able to put everything together, took the opportunity in 1986. So has Elvin been a disadvantage to you or a benefit? I would probably say neither. Um, it certainly hasn't been a disadvantage to me. If, if I can't drive. Yeah. That's always a little different, a little awkward on occasions, but I've never been able to drive, so it was something that I've, I've never lost. 
it has meant that I've developed a very good memory. I used to memorize the blackboard, you know, get out of my seat, go up, memorize the blackboard, bring it back. So in that sense, I would say oh, this has been an advantage because I've got a great memory. Um, I have a good sense of direction. I can read maps. My wife loves that because when we go around the world, she drives and I navigate. Yeah, and this is before GPS, so I'm probably now being you know, eased out of that role with GPS. But up until that point in time, I was the head navigator. You, know, you look at a transit system, I'm the guy who figures it out, even if I have to be only a few centimeters from the wall. But albinism has, has never been uh, an issue, shall I say, in my life. Uh, it's me. I can't see very well, I, I can't sit in the sun, I have to cover up. I would sit at a golfing tournament or a tennis tournament or a, a cricket match and I would be the guy in long, long jeans, long shirt, big floppy hat, keeping the zinc fax company in business and everybody else is wearing nothing around me. Okay, so I was always seen to be a little different in that regard. But it's just been a part of my life. Uh, it's not been an advantage, it's not been a disadvantage per se. As I said, you know, I wanted to be an astronomer. I didn't want to drive a car. I didn't want to fly an aircraft. Sometimes I would feel, gosh, if I had slightly better eyesight, maybe I could really join the astronaut corps and fly into space. But yeah, that was never as big a draw to me as standing beside a telescope, looking at, at the cosmos for real, so as to speak, and sharing that love with people around me. So as I say, albionism has just been me. It, it's been a part of my life, not an advantage, not a disadvantage. Have you discovered any stars yet? Ah, well, every time you look at the night sky, there's something new and something exciting. You're not going to find me on the front page of the Australian or the Advertiser or the Age, but you will find my name in astrophysical journals. You will find my name scattered within professional astronomy. But, um, you know, I am not Stephen Hawking's. I am not Albert Einstein. I am one of those people who engages in bread and butter astronomy. But I bring my students the joy of observing. Maybe one day one of those folks will be a Steve Hawking's and I'll look back and bask in their, in their glory, shall we say. But no, I have never found anything that was truly noteworthy. But then again, I'm just happy to contribute. And your face is regularly appearing on television in North America as well, talking about astronomy. Astronomy and space science, uh, the national carrier, uh, CTV News Channel over in Canada, uh, has got me as one of their go-to people. Every time Hubble finds something that they don't understand, every time there is a shuttle launch and they want commentary about what the heck they're doing up there, and so I'm just about the first person they call. So it doesn't matter whether or not it's the 7 a.m. Uh, news bite over breakfast or whether or not it's the late night launch at 11 p.m. You know, I'm, I'm there for them. As far as I'm concerned, I'm delighted to be able to give them input because it pulls science into the, the public domain and gives perhaps you know, the next Paul Delaney the opportunity to get excited over what they are studying. So if they want me, I'm there. Fantastic. And the final question, if you're talking to parents, advising parents who have children with albinism and they're trying to figure out what they should do for their kids, what would you advise them? Listen to what the child really wants to do and give them every encouragement, which I'm sure they're probably doing anyway, but don't automatically assume, gosh, they might be able to do that. At some point, the parent and the child may have to come to the realization that a particular goal might be out of their reach, but certainly that doesn't happen initially. Uh, when I talk to students at the university, when I talk to uh, children at school, one of the things that I always want them to do is to, to embrace their passion. If they've got a goal, if they've got a dream, if they've got a desire, give them every opportunity to be successful. Worry about the reality of it later on. <laughs> Let, let's see whether or not the child in question really has the motivation to go forward. So listen to them. And if they want to be an astronomer, despite the fact that they have very poor vision, don't slow them down. See whether or not they've really got to get up and go and the desire to go off and do it. So be very supportive of them, even when it might appear that the choice is less than practical. Because you never know. It may not be less than practical at all. Let the, let the child decide.